Hi, uh, well, welcome to uh, this afternoon's session, which is uh, of an industrial nature. Now, as Mike said, we used to have people from industry, but now we, uh, this year we're having people who've worked closely with industry. So, uh, first speaker is David Greer from New York University, taking it for a spin. So thanks very much. And uh, I, I want to express my gratitude for uh, the invitation to come here. This has been a lovely couple of days so far, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow, too. Um, OK, so I'm an academic, and, and my group does blue sky research. Uh, and yet, uh, we've spun out a number of companies and licensed inventions uh, to still other companies. And what I thought I would do is um, share a little bit of, of the experience of uh, how we as academics can spin out, uh, can take our ideas and spin them out into products and processes that actually have real world, world value. And you know, maybe some thoughts about why you might want to. Uh, and, and to get rich is not the answer uh, because uh, this is not the solution to that. <laughs> um, okay. so. Uh, so I'm calling it take take it for a spin, and quite obviously I'm going to show you pictures of things spinning because that's how I, how it all starts out. So I'm uh, I'm also talking about taking it for a spin, like uh, how you might want to take your your science, your ideas, and uh, and uh, shop them around uh, in in there I say it, the real world. Okay, so um, so uh, these are uh, particles in an optical trap. I'll talk about like uh, more about them. You may, you may know very well about uh, what, what you're seeing. It's not a new picture at all. Um, this one is a new picture. Uh, uh, these are particles that are spinning also. Uh, they're not in optical traps. They're in an acoustic trap. Um, so these are acoustically levitated particles. And you might notice that they're also spinning. And in case you think that it's all Photoshop, because I, you know, who wouldn't? Uh, I, I brought it with me. So, so here. Uh, uh, so the experiment's running here. Uh, and it's actually displaying the principle that I hope to talk about by the end, because I'd like to put in some new science, well, what I think is some new science by the end. Um, the difference between these is that the, the particles on the left are being driven by a force field created with a wave. The motion that seems to have stopped on the right um, is the result of activity. So these are passive particles, but they've become active through their interaction with the wave in a way that I'd like to talk about and pitch to you. Because I think it's a new idea. It's an idea that we call um, emergent activity. And uh, this is a great community to bring it up in. It's not published yet. Um, and it's a great community to bring it up in because, um, it, of course, it, A, might, might not be correct, and B, might not be new. And if either of those things are true, I bet you'll tell me. And uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's, that's really good. So, okay, so as I said, I'm a soft matter scientist. Here's some soft matter. It's a colloidal crystal. Um, this is an interesting colloidal crystal because it's metastable. So these are um, charge stabilized polystyrene spheres that should repel each other. And yet here you have a, a metastable crystal. This is, um, again, experimental data. I'm an experimenter. Um, and uh, yeah, so Renee, there, there you go. Uh, so on the basis of, of stuff of uh, experimental observations like that. Uh, my group spun out a company called Arix. Um, that was, uh, the Arix went on for about a decade and eventually got bought out by a much larger company. Uh, and uh, more recently, we started another company called Spherix. You might ask why the Ys and the Xs. Um, and it's because apparently investors like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I'm actually not kidding. And if you can put a Q in, that's also really good. Um, we couldn't figure out how to, and you, you also have to be able to own the name. So, uh, so these are names that we could own that have Ys and Xs, if not Qs. Um, okay, and so that was founded in 2014. It's still going as a, uh, it's actually based in New York City. So when you come to visit, we can actually come and see the startup company and what, and what it's doing. Um, just this year, we founded another company called Audix, uh, which again is, um, is, is based on science that we'll talk about, but I'm not gonna talk too much about Audix. Okay, so um, all three of these companies uh, are based on the physics of wave matter interactions. So the, I, what, for me, what that means is that we can encode information into the wave fronts of a wave and then use that information uh, to control how matter behaves. Alternatively, uh, 
a wave scattering off of some object uh, has encoded onto its wavefronts information about that object. And we can extract that information both for science and for commerce. So uh, Arix was uh, using the information to control matter. Spherix is extracting the matter, uh, extracting the information to characterize the matter. One of the things I wanna talk about in this community is what happens when you put that together. So, so you don't just have the wave telling the matter what to do. You don't just have the matter uh, imprinting its information onto the wave. You have the matter changing the structure of the wave and then that changed structure influencing the forces that the matter uh, experiences. So it's a composite system made of particles and waves interacting with each other. And this composite system can have some interesting behavior that, that I hope I'll take you through, because uh, that's, that, that's uh, one of the properties we call emergent activity, which is, um, so just to set the scene, it's a mechanism by which a system of passive particles, not active individuals, but passive particles, can become active when they interact with each other through, the, uh, through waves that they scatter. So most active matter is made of individually active objects like bacteria or motor proteins. And then their interesting collective behavior comes perhaps from non-reciprocal interactions driven by their non-reciprocity. I wanna talk about the converse where you can have non-reciprocal interactions among passive things and that, that non-reciprocity uh, results in activity. It's, a, it's an alternative form, I hope. <laughs> you can tell me otherwise. Um, and so uh, we'll take it for a spin, uh, also by talking about actual and, uh, and potential commercial applications. So you know, get started where, the, where we should get started, and that's with Kepler explaining comet tails. Uh, uh, you know, Kepler proposed that comets have tails because the light of the sun exerts forces on the dust on the surface, blowing the dust off like a, like a, a fluid, uh, blowing colloids, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you know, it's a hell of a conjecture 400 years ago. Um, except that I should mention that isn't Kepler. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is. Uh, we were told, you know, it turns out that this picture was discovered uh, like about a decade ago, it's actually labeled as being Kepler. And so the other picture that most of us would recognize as Kepler apparently is a picture of some other dude. Uh, uh, um, so about 120 years ago, um, you know, so of course Maxwell, Maxwell said there's a basis for Kepler's conjecture uh, in, in electromagnetism, the theory of electromagnetism, uh, which predicts um, that electromagnetic waves can exert forces. Uh, the first experimental observation was 120 years ago, uh, a real experimental tour de force of an incredibly tiny force, uh, you know, an observation of an incredibly tiny, commercially useless force. Until, you know, people started to think, what can I do with this force, <laughs> right? You know, so, so, you know, 60 years ago, uh, the first uh, season of Star Trek, we have tractor beams, uh, you know, and it's obvious that a tractor beam, if you don't know Star Trek, I mean, it's... Uh, you've got a lot of television to watch. It's really important. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so a tractor beam is some wave that I can use to light you up that's going to pull you in along the length of the wave, right? And, and, and you know, so force is exerted by waves, but in a funny way, the uh, waves that pull. It turns out this isn't such a new idea at all. It's 100 years old. Um, that's the, uh, the, the, fir the first mention of a tractor beam in science fiction was in Amazing Stories from 1931, and I have a copy of that on the wall of my office. Uh, okay, so uh, science fiction became science fact when Art Ashkin and his collaborators at Bell Labs discovered optical tweezers. So this wasn't an invention, it was a discovery. It was a a actually a sort of a classic laboratory accident. I'd be happy to talk about that. And uh, it it's a big deal. Um, and he did get, finally got the Nobel Prize for it uh, when, when he was in his 90s. Um, so we're gonna take Art's idea, show you um, how you can ramp it up into something that has commercial applications using the physics of wave matter interactions. So here's a typical instrument that yeah, you would use to do this kind of work. Um, and if it looks simple, it's because it's simple. Um, if it looks complicated, it's, because you haven't tried it, it's simple. Um, it really, all you have is a laser that's shining into the objective lens of a microscope. The uh, lens focuses the light 
and now you've got an optical trap. That's all that Art Ashkin's optical tweezers were. I, I know this because when I was a postdoc, I called up and asked him if he would teach me how to do it. He said, sure, come on over. He, we took apart his instrument, put it back together again. Then he took me to lunch. What a nice, I mean, just an unnaturally nice person. Okay, so, um, so all you need is a laser and an objective lens. You shine it into your, your colloidal sample and uh, you know the force exerted by the wave that Kepler conjectured should exist works and you can push things along. Uh, but the idea is that you can do better if you encode information into the wave um, uh, to, to, to get a more controlled outcome. Uh, and so I want to talk about how you do that, because then the flip side of encoding the information in is uh, extracting the information uh, that's already in there. Okay, so um, for me, any kind of wave like the electric field and light, you know, it's just going to be monochromatic because that's simple. It doesn't have to be, but um, but we're going to we're, we're just sort of talking among friends. Um, and the structure, the spatial structure of the wave, has at least three opportunities for control, including topological control. And the, uh, the topological part can be important because as you know, many topological features of a system are protected and therefore you don't have to get things right for them to work. So, um, so you have the amplitude profile, which is real valued and non-negative. You have the phase profile. Um, uh, again, that talks about which direction the wave is traveling and the polarization. Now, I'm not even gonna think about the polarization today. Uh, so no spin-induced forces. So we're going to use that wave to light up a particle. And at this point, the, um, the particle is dead simple. It's characterized by only one number. It has no shape, size, anything like that. All it's got is a dipole polarizability. We're just like paring it down to the absolute minimal. We're saying nothing about the particle, really. And uh, if I light it up with the electric field, it becomes uh, an induced dipole. Uh, again, you could also think of, of lighting up an, an object with a sound wave. And of course, it's going to have some response to the sound wave also. It turns out that's more interesting because um, if, I light, if I light a particle up with a sound wave, it vibrates like a dipole, dipole polarizability. But it also squishes because we're squishy. So it also squishes. That's a monopole response. So sound interactions with sound have a monopole response and a dipole response as well as higher order responses. In light, you don't have the monopole response because if I light you up with an electric field, you don't become charged necessarily. So that's interesting. I thought sound was gonna be simpler. It's actually more complicated. It's more rich, um, but, but let's get started. All that the particle does at this point is it gets polarized. And the dipole, the induced dipole, interacts with the electric field of course, and, and experiences forces and gradients of the electric field that pull it to either where the light is bright or where the light is dark, depending on the nature of the uh, dipole polarizability. That's fine. But this dipole is also oscillating at, at the frequency of light. And what we're thinking about is the average force that the thing feels averaged over, uh, uh, averaged over one uh, oscillation period. So that oscillating uh, dipole couples to the magnetic field of light. And that's, you know, if I said that this is how you design a force field, you would be bummed. Because <laughs> I've got, you know, I've got to write down the electric field, the magnetic field, um, you know, uh, especially if you're trained in the United States, you don't know what units these things come in. You know, it's hard. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to draw your attention to the date on this, on, uh, on this citation. Uh, 1973, right? The idea that you have to properly account for, the, um, for the, os the, the oscillating dipole's oscillation, the coupling to the dual field, that was, is a comparatively recent discovery. I can take this and I can, uh, you know, so you couple to the field, the oscillating part couples to the dual. I can take this and I can uh, re-express it in terms of a current. Like if you're a quantum mechanics fan, you'll recognize uh, thing grad thing as a current of some sort. So um, I can re-express the force as a current. Now, I, I only have to worry about the electric field. The Maxwell's equations simpl simplify things for us. Uh, so that looks a lot cleaner. I want to draw your attention to the date on that. It's amazing that there's something new to say about electromagnetism, classical linear electromagnetism in the year 2000. Uh, OK, so we take our electric field. We put it into the, um, the beautiful, simple, current-based formalism for the force. 
uh, for this particle because you have to worry about the particle having, you know, it does, you know, I've said it's very simple, but it does have a dipole moment, um, you know, a dipole polarizability, put that in. And what I get, I want to draw your attention to because this shows up again and again and again in physics and is often overlooked. Um, it's just a simple thing. It's, this is all there is at the dipole, at dipole order. There is a part that's, cons that, that's proportional to the gradient of the intensity. The amplitude squared is the intensity. So the, the gradient of the intensity uh, is like a, well, the intensity is like the scalar potential for the force. It's like potential energy. Dead simple. And so therefore it's conservative. And that's what Art Ashkin used to make traps. And so the first thing that my group did when we moved to NYU was set this up and make a bunch of traps uh, that spell NYU, the institution we work for. Please send money. Thank you. <laughs> we'll do this for you if you do that for us. OK, so, um, so we can use our instrument uh, to take the single beam of light from the laser, uh, uh, impose a hologram on it to split the beam into many beams, uh, bring those many beams to a focus, trap a bunch of things in three dimensions, and move them around. So you can see we're starting to get closer to you know, potential commercial applications. So these are uh, silica spheres trapped in water. Uh, we put them at, at the vertices of an icosahedron because we could, and we wanted to show that we were in no way limited to the square grid that we're working with. You know, we can move things around in three dimensions quite nicely. Uh, and they change appearance as they move because they're moving in the third dimension. And uh, so that's, that's the first term. The first term does all that for us. All we're doing is looking at the intensity of, of the wave, and the particles are nothing more than passive tracers of interesting features of that intensity distribution. That's what optical trapping typically is. The particles are just passive tracers of the field that you've imposed. There's a second term, though. And that second term is a force that's guided by gradients of the phase. Again, that shows up all over the place. And if we use that, we can have this absolutely horrendous video, uh, which is, for some reason, jerky. Oh, well, don't worry about it. Uh, so you can see, hopefully, you can see things are going around. And that's because we've taken advantage of these phase gradients to impose a twist on the beam so that the particles that are illuminated uh, go around uh, in this handedness on the top and the opposite handedness on the bottom. Again, just as passive tracers this time of the gradient of the phase. This actually is a commercially useful uh, device. This is a gear pump with a five micron bore that is assembled and driven with a single static beam of light. So you just shine the light in, structured by a hologram. It creates the structure, and it works. And when I'm done with that device, I can flip the hologram off and, and, uh, and make a, like, turn the pump into a mixer or something else. So this actually has commercial applications. Um, and the reason we can make it is that you can do anything with holograms. So that's the projection of a hologram of my graduate student Sangyuk Lee's handwriting uh, that actually also works as optical traps. Uh, so that you can really have anything. And so if you, you want anything, you can have anything in three dimensions, including topological beams of light that are knotted and braided. What you're looking at is the intensity distribution. Um, so that's the intensity, the measured intensity distribution of a beam of light. So I, I draw your attention to the z-axis or um, alternatively to the z-axis, uh, 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 which, which you might see is the better part of a meter. So this, this is a beam of light that stretches a meter you know, with, with a relatively small core and is all twisted and braided. The intensity is all twisted and braided. And you can still impose phase gradients onto the twists and, and, and braids. And since the phase is encoded set, like, in many respects independently of the intensity in these holograms, I can have it go one way around the corkscrew or I can have it go the other way around the corkscrew. So I can trap things on the intensity gradients and then drive them around the corkscrew either way I want. Um, so here's that working. Um, so the, uh, the colored dots are reconstructions of, of two colloidal particles, uh, three-dimensional trajectories. They're moving up and down in three dimensions uh, in a single beam of light. It's just one laser beam. We've encoded two tractor beams in them uh, because we can, we're, they're, because we're cool. And um, the, the, the tractor beams are going opposite directions just to show that we can. They don't have to. And, uh, and so that you might notice they're sort of tilted a little bit in weird directions. Uh, that's because um, that was the only thing that we could make work. Okay. But um, so, so we've encoded these weird topological modes of light um, with holograms into the beam. Uh, the beam then acts as a tractor beam, moving things in three dimensions. So um, it really is a tractor beam in the Star Trek sense. 
Um, but more than that, it's a plan. Uh, it's actually a device that NASA is building for cometary missions. So the idea is to use these tractor beam modes to pull dust out of the tails of comets so that you don't have to drive your billion dollar spacecraft into a rubble field. Uh, so, so, so this is, as you might think, is that the commercial application for this technology? And, and so I'm gonna leave this as a question. Can you guess what the commercial application for this technology turned out to be? So here it is, gonna be in space, what's it good for? Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna answer that yet. Uh, you can ask me later. So the other part of this instrument is just an ordinary light microscope. So the blue laser um, lights the object up from the top uh, the, and the object, again, imprints its information onto the beam of light. We collect that imprinted uh, beam with the same objective lens and pass it through to a video camera. And what you see is that sort of bullseye pattern, which, is, which results from the interference between the scattered light and the light, uh, uh, the rest of the illumination, which is basically a plane wave. So the reason that's interesting is that we wanted to be able to see in three dimensions, this is a hologram, and so the idea is we can use that hologram to reconstruct the object's three-dimensional trajectory, X, Y, and Z. You might say, wow, that's useful. I, I, again, a holographic microscope doesn't have a one micron depth of focus. It doesn't have a 10 micron depth of focus. Um, this one that, that we're sort of looking at the data actually had uh, about 150 micron depth of focus. You can track an object, uh, you know, wow, that must have lots of commercial applications. And the answer is no, none. Absolutely not. That's not what's, what's interesting about this. What's interesting about this is the idea that the measured intensity, you know, as I said, is the is a result of the interference between the incident plane wave and the light that the particle scatters. And the uh, scattering is described by the, whoops, the Lorentz mean scattering function, um, you know, if, if you've got a simple thing like a sphere. And that function is parameterized by the sphere's position. I showed you, you know, we can track the particle in 3D. Um, by this, the, the particle's diameter, okay, that's interesting, and, uh, and the particle's refractive index. That turns out to be extraordinary. Uh, because I can now use this as a generative model to, um, to fit the, uh, the measured hologram to this, um, uh, to this theory. Uh, the, the fit looks pretty good. How good is it? Well, I've got tens of thousands of pixels going into each one of these fits. There's a lot of information going in. Even if each pixel is only five bits of data, like five bits of real information, uh, it turns out you can measure the position of the particle in 3D to within a nanometer in X and Y, and uh, so typically to about three nanometers in Z. So you've got a micrometer scale thing. You can track it with nanometer precision over a range of 100 microns. That's, that actually is pretty cool for science. Um, you can also get out the particle's diameter, if it's a sphere, to within a nanometer, to within molecular uh, precision. I'm not going to talk about this, but you can use this for a molecular binding assay, a label-free, real-time, time-resolved molecular binding assay, which actually does has com have commercial applications that I'm not supposed to talk about. Um, but there also... <laughs> There's also the thing that I am going to talk about, which is the refractive index that you get out per, um, at, at the level of a part per thousand, and that's pretty cool. So if I put that to work, you can imagine taking a colloidal sample, passing it through a microfluidic channel, flowing it down a uh, microfluidic channel through the laser illumination, record the interference pattern, uh, compare those to, the, uh, to scattering theory, um, use the comparison to get the size of the particle, its refractive index, and parenthetically, its position. That's actually useful as a quality control test. Uh, and uh, then what you get out is for each uh, particle in the sample, you plot one dot. Uh, in this case, it's refractive index and it's, its radius, um, what it's made of and how big it is. Each dot is one particle and they're colored by the uh, density of measurements in the sample. Um, and so, uh, this is a uh, result of about 2,000, 3,000 spheres. We recorded the data in 10 minutes. And you can analyze it in 10 minutes, too. It's quite, it's quite uh, you know, you're, you're getting like a lot of information. Let's see if we can understand it. Here's that plot again. What you take from this is that this sample, it was, again, made by hand so that it would be true. This sample uh, has within it, come on, uh, I'm having a very, okay, it, it, it tells you how big the particles are, what stuff they're made of, 
and how many, uh, how many each, uh, of each type you're seeing. And so what you can see from this is that there are small particles and large particles. So there are one micron diameter particles and there are 1.5 micron diameter particles. And you can see that there are silica and polystyrene, uh, polystyrene spheres. And you can see that by the refractive index. So these particles were all mixed together in one broth. They flowed down the channel. And uh, I, you know, of course I knew what was in there, but if you didn't know, you could find out. And that idea, that what stuff idea is where the value is because you can apply this to real world samples. You can see what's in there, how big they are and what they're made of even if you don't know a priori what, to, what you should expect to see. So you can apply this um, to pharmaceutical products, uh, to semiconductor polishing slurries, uh, to a regulatory compliance in the petroleum industry and water treatment industries. And I'm just gonna show you one real fast. And uh, if I seem distracted, it's because I'm having weird uh, PowerPoint issues. But anyway, um, so this is holographic particle characterization of a typical pharmaceutical product, an injectable bio, biopharmaceutical. So these uh, biopharmaceuticals come as protein solutions, solutions that, that you inject. You uh, want to get the, the proteins packed in as tight as possible, because if you have a large volume to inject, it hurts. <laughs> so you want a small volume. And as you pack the, as you pack the uh, proteins in together, they tend to aggregate. And insoluble protein aggregates are a problem because, uh, because uh, they're not bioavailable, so the drug doesn't work, and your immune system recognizes them as something to uh, clean up. So you can have what they call in the industry immunogenic responses with adverse clinical outcome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the, the, the companies really care. And if I look at this typical product, uh, it's just chock full of particles. Every single dot is one particle that came through in about two microliters of this, of this product. What a drag. Uh, so what are these particles? Well, it turns out a lot of them are silicone oil droplets. All your injectable drugs are loaded with an emulsion of silicone oil droplets because that's what that's used to uh, lubricate the plungers and the tubing in everything. So you really can't escape it except for intraocular uh, injections, which have to be silicone free because otherwise you have uh, little dots in your eyes forever. Uh, the other, another cluster uh, up there, those are breakdown products of the surfactants. This was a, a product that had been heated uh, beyond the point of sort of no recovery. And the polysorbate 80 that was used to stabilize it is broken down. These particles result from that breakdown. The real deal though, are these particles here. Those are protein aggregates. And this is, a, this is the signature of a biopharmaceutical product that's failed. So you can imagine, uh, and there, yeah, yeah that's, that, that's bad. Uh, so you can imagine that, that companies that make these products really care because by traditional techniques like dynamic light scattering, this is all you see. How many particles do you have? What's the size distribution of particles? That's typically all you get. Uh, that's all the information that they have. And we know that there are lots of particles in there, uh, including glass shards, rubber bits, bits of metal. Those are all okay. It's only the protein aggregates that we care about. Uh, and so with, uh, you know, so what's in there? And with this holographic particle characterization, you can find out. So this, you can, this is actually genuinely useful to industry. It's not why we developed the technology. We developed the technology because we wanted to track our particles in 3D. Uh, the other information, the size distribution, the refractive index of each of the particles, that came out of these fits for free, out of the nature of the generative model we needed to extract information from the wave. And uh, so there's a startup company. Uh, if you uh, work with colloids, emulsions, or anything like that, you want an Excite, and I can hook you up. This is an excellent tur uh, turnkey machine. You put 30 microliters of your sample uh, um, into, the, into the well, push the button, and, uh, and, the, and the result is done. My university loves it, uh, both because it makes them money. Uh, oh yeah, we, it, it's won all sorts of awards. That's great. And it's good for high throughput screening and everything. Um, my university likes it because uh, the company hires lots of NYU grads, which is, well, yeah, no, seriously, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very good thing. Uh, okay, so uh, why not do all this with sound? Uh, so for those of you who are not British, uh, the thing is a sonic screwdriver and the person is Doctor Who. 
Um, and that's his sonic screwdriver. Um, okay, for trapping, it's great because sound is a million times slower than light. Uh, and the force that's exerted by, a, uh, by a, a wave is the power in the wave in watts divided by the speed of the wave. So light is as bad as it gets and sound is a million times better. So yes, I know that that's, you know, that kind of scaling argument isn't true, but at least the prefactor is a factor of a million that you get to work with, and that's better than not. Um, we have control over amplitude and phase. Listen to me controlling the amplitude and phase of the sound that's reaching your ears. It's very easy to do with sound. It's very hard to do with light. And you have, of course, spectral content that you can control very easily with sound and is very expensive to control with light. The problem is um, because of uh, the needs of consumer electronics, we have megapixel projectors, megapixel detectors for light because that matches the capabilities of our retinas. Uh, but for sound, commercially, uh, we only have stereo. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, you know, uh, so we have to invent a lot of our own technology, which is un unpleasant, of course. Uh, but that's where the innovation comes from for industry. Uh, come on, David. Uh, where are the ears? And there we go. So you can make a camera. We, uh, so I had some college students build an acoustic camera. And the acoustic camera, you put uh, a thing between a, so a source of sound and a detector of sound, a scanning microphone. And you can record the phase and the amplitude, the phase and the amplitude of the wave that's scattered by the unknown object. We record it. Like in light, that's amazing, right? In light, you get to record that a photograph is just the intensity, no information about phase. A hologram is some information about amplitude, some information about phase, but you're, you've missed half the information. Uh, in sound, you can have it all at every frequency simultaneously. It's amazing. This, is, this is, turns out to be a monochromatic acoustic hologram. You've recorded the phase and the sound and the amplitude of, of some object. What's the object? Well, numerically refocusing, you realize that it is a ukulele. And so this is an image of a ukulele that was recorded in the sound that a ukulele makes. And you, know, you can use something even more interesting than a ukulele, like a disc, because we're physicists. <laughs> and, and of course, what you get from that is, um, is uh, the spot of Arago. Right, so, uh, so uh, what, you, what you've got is a, a bright, loud part in the middle, which is the spot of Poisson spot, the spot of Arago. Uh, and so you can, you can tell it's the spot of Arago uh, because uh, there's, there's Arago and there he is enjoying his spot. Uh, he published uh, the, the first experimental observation of the intensity of the spot of Arago in 1819. Weirdly enough, no one is, appears to have reported the, uh, the full measurement in sound. Uh, and so we have both the amplitude and phase of the spot of Arago, and it appears to be the first uh, report of the complete measurement, uh, just sort of an historical curiosity. What's the commercial importance of that, you might ask? <laughs> um, well, you can use sound, of course, to record information, but you can also use sound to, to trap things. As I said, there's a monopole response in addition to the dipole response. So the force ex exerted by a sound wave is slightly more complicated. That's a drawing of this object, of this device that I've actually got right here. You can trap a solid particle in a node of the sound wave. Uh, and uh, we'll focus on the intensity gradient part, which is conservative. And uh, we'll actually get to a point that all, already has commercial applications. You might not think it. So I just trap a particle in the node of a sound wave, give it a jiggle, ping. You can give it a jiggle in any number of different ways. And uh, so it'll jiggle in its acoustic trap. Um, so the dots are the measurement of the jiggle. And it's actually kind of fun. Those measurements we also do in sound. So we, we trap it in sound, we jiggle it in sound, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we uh, use sound to record its motions. This was actually, this particular data set was done with a camera, but uh, you can do it with sound also. The red is a fit to what you'd expect, you know, the damped harmonic oscillator <laughs> physics one, right? But it turns out, no, um, the drag model is really interesting. Um, it's, uh, um, it's called the uh, Babinet-Boussinesque Osain uh, drag model. If you get that right, if you really like handle the drag properly, then uh, what comes out of this fit is the mass of the object, uh, rel you know, the buoyant mass, that's why it's delta M. Uh, the buoyant mass of the object is, is these like little particles are trapping. It's about, you know, roughly microgram scale. Sorry, 
roughly milligram scale. So milligram scale object. If you've ever tried to weigh a thing in the lab, weighing a milligram is a bummer. There basically isn't technology to do it until today because this fit gets you out the, uh, the mass uh, with microgram precision. And it's not like a balance or a scale where, where you're comparing the weight to some reference force. It's actually a direct measurement of the inertial mass. So this would work in space also. In fact, it is. Um, so uh, that microgram precision on milligram masses has all sorts of commercial applications I'd be happy to talk about. And that's why we founded Audix. Uh, OK, so uh, you can take these ideas of acoustic trapping, scale them up. Um, so the, uh, Bruce Drinkwater and his collaborators um, pioneered the rate of making holographic acoustic traps. We have large arrays of transducers. It's really great. Um, we do it with just two transducers. So you take some particles. Um, you light them up with a sound wave. The particles get trapped at the node of the sound wave. And then interestingly enough, they gather themselves up into rafts. And that's what I want to close with is talking about that. Um, so they gather themselves up into, into two-dimensional rafts. And that's because if I've got particle one and particle two in the node of some uh, acoustic field, you've got the sound wave, the pressure wave from the sound lighting up each of those particles. Particle one then scatters some of that pressure wave to particle two. And so the scattered wave contributes to the force that particle two feels. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the pressure at particle two is the combination of the incident wave and the scattered wave from its neighbor. And, um, and so to leading order, that force should be called the Koenig interaction. But for some reason, people ignore the fact that uh, Koenig wrote about it in 1891. It's attractive. It depends on the volume of the particles. That's the monopole, uh, the monopole um, Sorry, the dipole uh, polarizability of a particle goes like the volume. Uh, there's a four scale out front. It's a one over R to the fourth attractive interaction. That's why things get pulled together into rafts. This is not correct, but it's good enough for right now. Uh, um, so it's a pair attraction, depends on range, and the scattered waves assemble the particles. That's not active. These things just get pulled together, hot damn. Now it's going to be active. Uh, so in addition to this leading order behavior, um, which pulls things together, uh, the force on particle two, you know, I can, I can expand it. I can go a little bit further. So it's the Koenig interaction plus corrections. And the corrections are interesting because the correction depends on the mass density of particle two. It depends on the size of particle two and on the size of particle one, but with different prefactors. And there's, there's, of course, a lot more with different prefactors, which means that this is not reciprocal. So if I switch the order of the, if I just flip the sign to figure out what's the force on particle one due to particle two, it's not the same, uh, and not the same magnitude at all, uh, because these correction factors are not the same. So there is, in fact, a net force on the pair of particles uh, that drives them. They come together because of the, of the cons uh, conservative attractive part, but then there's this non-reciprocal force, and what that does to them uh, is it makes them, uh, again, my PowerPoint makes me sad. It makes them go. Uh, and it was supposed to be much more dramatic than that. <laughs> and if I've got, so I've got, if I've got two particles, they go. If I've got three particles, they rotate. And I really, really, oh my God, look at that. Isn't it? That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, you know, forget PowerPoint, just see the real thing. It's here. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so if I levitate them, they actually go. It's cooperative motion. It is cooperative motion that's mediated by the scattered waves. Um, it is mediated by the scattered waves, and it doesn't obey Newton's third law, with apologies to Mike. Uh, um, you know, so it, it doesn't obey Newton's third law. It doesn't have to, because the residual momentum and ang angular momentum are carried away by the scattered wave. It's not a clue. The particles don't constitute a closed system. So what you have then, in, uh, in my closing remarks, um, is that uh, objects that scatter waves interact non-reciprocally. These are passive particles, and they interact non-reciprocally, even if the wave has no structure whatsoever. So these particles are not passive tracers of a force imposed by the, by the wave. Their, their motion arises from non-reciprocal interactions mediated by the waves they scatter. Uh, those non-reciprocal interactions allow the particles to harvest energy from the wave. Individually, the particles sit motionless. They can't harvest energy. They've got no way to do it. But collectively, they can. And they use that motion, uh, they use that energy to power their own motion. So that's a hallmark of activity. These particles are active. 
And their activity is um, just like biological activity. That's supposed to be bacteria swarming around. Um, but, oh, come on. Come on. Uh, but it works with passive particles. This is a simulation that a postdoc, Ella King, did. Uh, and this just shows uh, particles interacting in this way, a cluster, or an, an ensemble of them uh, coalescing into uh, rafts, and then those rafts continue to move because they've assembled themselves into active matter. So uh, this is with KT equals zero. It'd be interesting to, to ask what happens when you turn up temperature. So this form of acti activity is an emergent property of the organization of the particles. And interestingly enough, it's been at work on Earth um, from the beginning. Uh, because it can, this works with any kind of wave. It doesn't have to be a monochromatic sound wave. It could be water, uh, water ripples. It could be sound. It could be light. Any, uh, any wave that lights up particles and mediates interactions will mediate non-reciprocal interactions and will give rise to the possibility of emergent activity. So this is a way that nature has been organizing matter, undoubtedly, even in the epoch before biological activity evolved. So um, we have... Of course, the people to thank who did all the work uh, and a summary, which undoubtedly won't work with the state of my PowerPoint right now. So what I'll do is I'll just thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Remember, I didn't tell you what holographic traps are good for. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, um, so there, there's a uh, that's of course uh, there's um, a, a class of systems um, like gra driven gra uh, levitated granular matter where where the system is is actually being driven by an external force and then those driven particles interact uh, and and their interactions can be reciprocal or non-reciprocal and give rise to interesting collective behavior. Yeah, I would say that that's related. It's slightly different in the sense that the particles are actually being driven by the external wave. Like the, the whole point of shaking the thing is to put energy in. Whereas in this case, um, if the, the particles by the, like an individual particle is driven in that case. And in this system, an individual levitated particle would be motionless. So it would, it would have no way to extract energy. The closest example to this sort of like uh, acoustically levitated version that I can think of is a dusty plasma. So dusty plasmas similarly scatter um, plasma waves to each other, and those interactions, the resulting interactions, are non-reciprocal, unless the particles are identical. So you know, there's there's a sort of uh, there are subtle distinctions between driven systems and active systems, and uh, and. If I'm humming and hawing, it's because I'm still coming to grips with it myself. Very. Thank you very much. No, that that's that. Um, I I was I was unclear, and you're you're clarifying me. Yeah. So so of course I could have particles that have interesting shapes, like rocket ships, that will propel themselves in these sound waves. They'll scatter the wave and the way and the scattering. And and of course you can get that by just gluing three particles together, and off they go. Uh, so I'm talking about spheres specifically because they are a passive system. So I want to start with a model passive system that cannot transduce energy and then demonstrate that through the interactions, the collective system develops the ability to transduce energy so that it's an emergent property. So the system is, is, is designed to emphasize this aspect. We also have two different particle species, uh, which are both passive, and one affects the other one, but not vice versa. Um, and then you also get these dimers and trimers which rotate and so on. So it's a different mechanism, completely different mechanism, but essentially it gets the same phenomena. I think it's a two particle and many particle scale. So I don't know. If are the individual colloids in that case active though? Not active. So how do they? They are isotopic. They are isotopic. They don't move. 
but one species creates a chemical field to which the other one responds. It's, it's like uh, like Yasna, like the 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 uh, um, evaporating droplets. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, uh, that those systems eventually, you know, they, they carry their fuel. They use up their fuel. If there were, were a way to refuel them, they would go forever. Yep. Yep. Mixing of liquid with binary is it mixes us again to a total on I think um, phenomenologically it's so closely related, although the mechanism is very different across. That's right. No, I, I think, they could, I think uh, that you're right. I think it could be all the same class of systems where individually the objects are passive. Um, and although, uh, okay, sorry, uh, individually objects are passive, but collectively they become active and the nature of the activity depends on the organization. And uh, so different organizations of these systems actually can coalesce into, into passivity again. And that is, that's an interesting, there's an interesting distinction because when these things jam up and all of the non-reciprocal forces cancel and the system becomes quiescent again, in the kinds of systems that I'm thinking about, the ability to transduce energy again goes and these things no longer consume fuel. so like the real traditional case where you just have active particles I mean, those, those things continue to consume fuel continuously, right? And, and so their non-reciprocity, and so I'm being clammy demonist because I can't help myself. Um, so, 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 uh, so their non-reciprocity, their interest in collective behaviors comes from the fact that they are consuming energy and transducing it individually. So that, that's sort of, I, I would call that, I, I don't want to call it conventional, I would call, I would call that normal activity. Yeah? You still have an effect of the energy, yeah. so you can't have anything non reciprocal or active there. Okay. Yeah. Whereas here, you could integrate that and get some kind of theory, but it would still be a dynamical theory that wouldn't derive from any kind of free energy stuff, I think. And that's because the because the photons are different because it is driven, it's got this. It makes it once you do it, you have something which is not. A, a, a static interaction. There's a bit of a passing through the system and going out the other side. I think that's it. Yeah, sort of like a heat engine of sorts. Yeah. You have a one minute answer to the question about this. Oh, yeah. No, what, what, what are holographic? You know, 25 years after the invention of holographic optical tweezers, what is their primary commercial application? Blood typing. Thank you. <laughs>